don't need to clap yet. <laughs> but thank you. So, guys, uh, we are from Mobile Day. My name is Ricardo. I'm with my colleague Marlene. Marlene. <laughs> okay. And we are here to show you a little bit what we do at Mobile. It's a sponsored talk. I need to uh, tell this uh, up front so we could choose what to present. So, we're going to try to present to you an overview of what we do with the data without revealing too much of our competitive advantage right, on the market. So if you live in Germany and you own a vehicle, most likely you have heard from us. Uh, Mobility is the leading platform of uh, buying and selling vehicles online. We have 12 million users, active buyers per month. Uh, 1.6 million uh, listings online on a, any day. And our main source of revenues are our, our dealerships, which are our paying customers. And currently we have a little bit more than 40,000 dealerships that are uh, customers of Mobile Day. And uh, Mobile Day supports the process of buying and selling vehicles online. And it's more complex than uh, any other good that you might try to buy online because it's a, really, uh, it's a high value good, which comes with some implications there. Because for many people, it's a stressful situation when you're trying to sell a vehicle or you want to buy a vehicle because a lot of money involved, a lot of uncertainty. For that reason, the journey to buy or sell a car looks more like this. It's not a straight line. And there are a lot of questions that comes up for, uh, for a regular user uh, during this uh, process of selling or buying a car. First thing, how much is my car worth? If I want to sell my vehicle, I'm not an expert, I'm not sure how much is the market willing to pay for it. A second question that might come uh, to you is like, how fast I want to sell my car? Do I need the money right now or can I take longer to get a better deal for my vehicle? Another question, uh, what's the right audience that I need to target to sell my vehicle? Do I publish only at Mobile? Mobile has a strong partnership with Bakeland Zeigen where we can uh, publish the posts, uh, the listings there. And uh, we can, uh, it's a question that we, it might come to you when you're selling. Another one, it's like uh, Mobile, it's a platform that offers uh, extra uh, booking features that might uh, increase the visibility of your listing. Do you need that? It's a question that at some point you might ask yourself if you're, not, if you're having difficulty to sell it. And then when you go to the buying process, the first question, what's my next car? How do I find it? And which car actually best fits my needs? I might not be an expert of knowing how the make models, so I'm not sure which one fits my need, if I have a family, if I need a sports car, and so on. And finally, how exactly I find this online after I decided which car that best fits my need. And of course, after you have everything set up, the main question is, uh, which seller offers me the best offer that's the best deal for me? Finally, at the moment you found that the seller that you want to open a negotiation, can you trust it? Can you trust the seller? Uh, usually online marketplaces have a severe uh, problem with online fraud, and there, it's a question that might come to you. Finally, at the moment that you want to finalize your deal, how do you do it? Do I need financing? Do I need some extra money? How do I close the deal? So there are lots of uh, questions that come up in these scenarios. And for each one of those questions at Mobile Day, we have a data product on it. What does it mean, a data product? We have a machine learning model that supports the user in making those decisions at these points during the journey. <clears throat> We're gonna try to, uh, I'm going to try to cover a little bit of each of them. So for the first question, how much is my car worth? Uh, we have a price prediction model. So, which means with uh, very few features of the vehicle, we can already suggest what's the price of your vehicle. The second thing, uh, do I want to sell fast or do I want to get more money for my vehicle? We have a recommendation for different products in our platform that can lead you to uh, sell fast. So, we can connect you directly with a dealership that might be willing to pay a certain value for your vehicle or another product that's to publish your listing online and try to get more money out of it. To target the, the right audience, we have what we call the digit, digital market hub, 
which is a product that, uh, given your your vehicle and the features, we can find out which audience it's for which audience this is most attractive. So how we can improve the number of leads you get for your uh, for your listing online. Um, also for this. Uh, product of booking extra features, we have what we call Add Turbo, which is a product that evaluates your listing and see if any of the features can have a positive impact on the number of leads you get uh, for, your, for your vehicle. For the buying part, we have, of course, search and ranking for finding the vehicles. We have vehicle recommenders, so given your, given your profile, we can recommend you different uh, types of vehicles if you need an SUV for a family or sports car, as I mentioned. Uh, how to find the best car? We have also recommenders for queries. Our query is not free text query, it's rather structured, but sometimes the users, they have problems in defining which filters to use to find their vehicles. We have a product that suggests uh, those queries. Finally, uh, not finally yet, but for the price, how do you find the best deal? We have another product, another machine learning model to predict the market prices. So we not only predict the price for a given vehicle, but how it compares to the, the whole marketplace that we, uh, the data that we have. So we can see if it's a good deal or it's uh, too expensive, the vehicle and so on. Finally, we have models to detect fraud in our platform. If a seller trying to deceive the buyers, and also if the sellers lost their account due, due to account takeovers. And the last one we have is the prediction of financing intent. So given a, bu a buyer and his profile and his data, we can figure out more or less if the user, it's a user that would uh, require financing to close the deal. And we suggest uh, for this user to go into our partners, that uh, banks that would uh, support the user uh, getting financing for the vehicle. It's a broad overview of all these data products. And we're going to take a look uh, a bit deeper in some of them. And I give the word to Marlene. Thanks. Yeah, so the first one that we chose for this deeper look is our search ranking because we thought that makes sense also given the audience. Probably nothing I would say is new to you, but still I would like to present our approach to this. So generally when you come to our site, you are interested in finding a car. But in order to find a car, you first have to search for it. Even if you know already a little bit what you're searching for and you have some search criteria uh, in your mind, there will probably be a lot of vehicles or cars that fit these search criteria more probably than you can even scroll through. So wouldn't it be nice if we could somehow put those items first in the list of your search results that are also most relevant to you, so most personally relevant. And we try to achieve this by using like a learning to rank approach, so a machine learning approach. For this, we take historical data on searches. Basically, we try to create snapshots of the moment in time when users searched in the past. So we know which listings were shown to you and also at what position they were shown to you. We know other features about the listings that were displayed in the search result page. We know whether you interacted with these listings, as in whether you clicked on them or you maybe uh, even parked an item, which in our case means you moved it to some basket um, for later, or even whether you contacted a dealer. So we have these levels of interaction, basically. And um, we also have some sort of profile on the user at the moment of their search, which is, however, just like an aggregation of the user interactions with our site. So we know like in the past two weeks, a user maybe has interacted mostly with blue cars or something like this. So there, there's some sort of user profile that we use for this. And then we create like a training data, which corresponds of um, features that come from the car itself and features that come from the user, features that kind of combine the car and the user and how well they they fit. 
And then we um, try to rank items in a fashion such that the most relevant ones will be placed on top. For this, we need some sort of target or label, right? The relevancy signal. And here we take it from this user interaction. So we say if you clicked an item, it's more relevant compared to when you didn't click it. If you parked it, it's even more relevant. So we come up with this heuristic of creating um, labels that are based on this implicit feedback that the user gives us. Then we train a learning to rank model based on these features and target. Um, we use a lambda mart model. At least I think in the last model it was lambda mart. And then we try to optimize for NDCG here. How do we do this in practice? Maybe how is this implemented in our um, environment or a production system? So we use Google Cloud Platform mostly. Um, and so we try to do as much of the data querying in BigQuery. Then we schedule certain jobs in Python using Airflow. This is mostly the feature processing. Then um, we also build the model in uh, Python. And we um, then upload the model that we have along with a feature set into Elasticsearch. There's an LTR plugin which lets you directly use certain types of models and certain types of features so that this would be online, passable, and directly available, basically, as a user searches. So this is, as a user sends a search request, uh, it, it will go through our model, and also we have a custom um, uh, service or API that provides this aggregated user profile of the user currently searching, and so we have basically a model that is running online, and it's personalized because it can take a user profile into account. Um, yeah. And I think maybe I would skip some of the things here, but I think what is most interesting about these um, models maybe is our specific learnings that we have from it. So since we try to achieve like a personalized search uh, ranking, of course, it's important that we have some sort of user profile. So there needs to be some thought put into how do you store or represent such user profiles? And also, how do you deal with users that have not visited your page before? This is like the cold start problem. Do you create some default profile for them, which is what we do? Um, and then also in our case, so I presented only this really schematic framework of how we, sorry, I'm, I am taking too long, I know, um, of how this is uh, designed. Um, but usually we don't only want to optimize for the user satisfaction, so whatever is relevant to the user, but we also have some business requirements like sometimes dealers pay maybe for certain features and they want to be ranked higher. And so we also try to combine multiple objectives basically in our model so um, that we can account for both of these interests directly within our machine learning model. And of course, we have to watch out for biases since we use this implicit feedback of the users. We know that the behavior of the user is already influenced by however we displayed the results to begin with. So we have tried some approaches to correct for these biases, but I'm not going to go into detail about this. Do we have more time? Yes. Then? So this is our search <coughs> deep dive. <laughs> this is how we try to personalize your search results at Mobile. A very different but also really cool product is the market price prediction. So now let's say you already have like a candidate set of uh, certain vehicles that you find interesting, but you don't really know if the price is appropriate or not. Um, you want a fair price and um, we try to guide you in finding a fair price by providing this little UI as you can see here. So for most um, vehicles you will see uh, a prediction or estimation uh, whether the um, vehicle that you're currently looking at is uh, actually a fair price or not. Again, this is based on a machine learning model. We train on historical data on uh, listings and their final prices when they were sold or at least deleted from our page. Then we train an XGBoost regression model. We um, evaluate those models in terms of mean absolute percentage error. And uh, basically, in a scenario to get to the scale from very good to high price, you would compare the price that has been inserted by the dealer maybe to the price that your model predicts and then based on some threshold of deviation you would come up with a label of it being a good price or not so good price. Um, I think maybe to, because of time reasons I should I skip this? I think we're good on time. Yeah, okay. Because last time we were so over time. 
Uh, so the tech stack that we use for that is very similar, I think, to the LTR model that um, I presented earlier. So we try to do as much of the querying in BigQuery from Google Cloud. And then we schedule a couple of um, jobs in Airflow. In this case, actually, a lot of the feature processing and modeling is happening in R. This is just by choice of our data scientist here. And... Um, then we upload an H2O model um, into um, the Google Cloud storage where it can be um, retrieved from a custom-built REST API in Scala. It can pass this model. So this is, a, uh, that's a, this is why we use H2O as a modeling framework because it provides Java and Scala passable models, basically. So our data scientists build the model and then a data engineer would try to also um, just recapitulate the features that were built, but then the model would be directly available for production. And then um, within the service, we generate these online predictions that are available then as a user searches again. We're at each time that a listing is changed, maybe a feature is changed, this also triggers uh, that the model is updated, or not the model, but that the prediction is updated for the particular car. We have another branch here, maybe in this pipeline layout, to just demonstrate, of course, we always have to deal with consistency between what we do in the development part and the production part, so to make sure that uh, everything that's happening in this REST API, um, which is more Java-based, and the development part, which in this case is R-based, we um, also um, automatically create certain requests to this API and get the predictions and compare them basically to the developmental predictions. This is a little bit of a manual approach. Uh, this model is updated every three months or so, so we typically monitor KPIs in the meantime to see if something really deviates, for instance, if um, the distribution of good and bad prices, etc., if this really shifts in one or the other direction, we would also, of course, update the model, but generally three months is like um, just practically um, feasible and enough to account for most of the dynamics in the market currently. Um, what are the learnings from our market price prediction models? So this, of course, works best for cars for which we have a lot of reference cars. So if you have a very, very particular car that has been maybe even, um, I don't know, um, pimped up in a specific way for your own requirements, then there would probably not be a reference car to make such uh, price predictions. So typically restrict that model to kind of default cars and you have to select um, specifically which cars can go into these models. Also, another learning is maybe that sometimes model, of course, can behave in, in a way that it's not intuitive to, for instance, the uh, seller or dealer. So say that a seller enters all the features of a car and then it gets a price rating. Uh, and then maybe the dealer just adds that the car has a radio or something and all of a sudden the price uh, drops or becomes becomes less fair or too high. So basically having added a radio as another feature makes the car cheaper, which is a little bit counterintuitive. So maybe the model has picked up on some relations here. Maybe it has been overfitting to something. I don't know at this point, but definitely it's something that doesn't seem intuitively right to the user and we try to account for this for some features at least by adding monotonic constraints to the model so that it's forced to learn a specific say um, monotonically increasing relationship to a specific feature so it's not allowed to go down in price or up in price as it wants so this was an interesting learning I think based also on a lot of feedback from people interacting with this so um, yeah then we have another in deep dive into another data product, Thanks, which Marlene. I don't know much about. So. <clears throat> yeah, I can say a little bit about the, our fraud fighting initiatives. Um, so the problem for us is that every online platform has also is to, it's, we are target front scammers who try to get money out of the, out of the sellers or trying to hijack their accounts. And our challenge is how to predict or detect when a seller is fraudulent. And for this, uh, the data we have, uh, we have historical data of uh, past listings that have been manually evaluated by a customer service agent and they know if it's fraud or not. We use this uh, to, to build our data set for training our models. And of course we have the, uh, the data 
from the user that was fraudulent, how is the behavior, and uh, a lot of metadata. So in our case, we are tracking a lot, different from what the keynote uh, speaker presented. We are tracking for the good of it, so try to protect our users. Um, the model and metrics you're using, we use precision and recall as uh, as metric. And so it's a model stacking, actually, that we are using. The technology is very similar to what Marlene presented. You're using GCP, BigQuery. Our, uh, most, a lot of our data is stored in Mongo due to the decision from the engineers to have this in production. And we also use H2O framework to provide this flexibility for data scientists to work in the creative part and data engineers to take care that the service is respons uh, responsive in production because all these predictions, they are online predictions. Um, our pipeline here, we assume that the behavior of the fraudsters change on a, on a regular basis. So we retrain our model once a week, including new data to uh, capture the new behavior of the fraudsters. Uh, the pipeline is pretty much the same here by decision of the, the data science, uh, they implemented everything in Python using Airflow on the GCP platform. The, the model is then exported to a Mongo database that can easily be uh, loaded from the Java, uh, Java service, which is the REST API that provides the predictions uh, whenever there is an edit or an insertion of a listing in our platform. When there is a prediction, then if we are certain about the prediction with a high level of confidence, we can automatically block or delete a listing and the user itself. If we do, are not very, we, if we don't have this uh, high confidence, then we, but it's still suspicious, then we send to customer service and they would manually evaluate and give us feedback, which is the data that we use for training. There are other ways that we collect this data, so the data is not totally biased by the prediction of our models. Uh, users, they can go and they can uh, flag listings that they think uh, it's uh, fraudulent, and this would also go to customer service, and then we get this data that's not biased by the, our predictions. Um, one of the KPIs that we are using lately is the risk exposure, so the share of users that come to our platform and they're exposed to fraud. So they had any view in a listing that was later assigned or detected as fraud. I'm very proud to say that uh, this uh, metric is now below 1%, so it's very low comparing to other platforms, other marketplaces uh, of the percentage of users that are exposed to fraud. Some of the learnings that uh, we had in this project is that uh, we need to arrange our data in a time-wise fashion because we cannot uh, use the behavior of the dealer, the, sorry, the fraudster uh, in any particular given time. So our data sets, they are uh, our training data, we have to uh, split the training and test by time. Another thing is the, that we have to be careful when considering is the impact of our false positives detections because this might harm our business, also bring a lot of volume to customer service agents. So that's something that our thresholds, we are constantly evaluating and doing analysis to see if we keep the right balance at a given point in time because there is also a lot of seasonality. People usually sell their vehicles, they choose spring to do that, is when we have a high volume in our platform. And finally, one thing that we had to uh, invest a lot of time is to explain the predictions that we do for our customer service agents. It's not just a black box that the agents would see uh, this list is fraudulent, but they don't know why. And lately, we are using uh, some techniques that can uh, support our customer services to agents to make those decisions. Um, how am I in time? Pretty much. So I, I will skip the second part I was about account takeover. I would invite you to find us in our booth. We are sponsoring. We have a booth at the end of the room here. Uh, our data scientists, I think we are four or five data scientists here from Mobile attending the conference. We are happy to answer your questions uh, if you come to our booth. Of course, we are also recruiting, always looking for good talents in data engineering, front-end, data science. And uh, I guess that's it. Thanks for your attention. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.
We have time for questions or I, any any short question right now or as uh, announced later in the booth? No? It's all right. Anyone? There's one question over there. Uh, thanks for your insights. Um, I would have one question regarding your learning to rank model um, mm -hmm. in search ranking. Could you share uh, some insights about the uplifts you generated uh, when going live with learning to rank? <laughs> um, oh, this is a long time ago, to be honest. Uh, so we ran some A-B tests on our first version, and I think we saw some uplift. I think our KPI usually is something like users with context. At least this is like our North Star kind of, and we did see... Uh, some improvement in the one digit area, like I think six, seven percent. But uh, I should also say that this is compared to a non machine learning based ranking that we had previously. So previously, we really had some sort of uh, business driven logic of sorting where the first page was basically just premium dealers and so forth. So what I'm saying is that I think the baseline was a little bit easy. <laughs> Usually now when we try to iterate over the model, we typically just see like really small improvements in like one or two percentage points. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Mm -hmm.